to me, all right? Knock it off! The soap opera is an underrated element of the sports landscape. A team that generates copious amounts of drama that encapsulates an entire season, leading to fascination from other fan bases and anguish from the team in question. The most recent example of this season-long saga would be the 2018 Pittsburgh Steelers. The off-field antics and situations were seeping with tension. The ever-evolving sagas of the players and team would unfold in many ways. Once that dried up, the on-field product would collapse, resulting in a tale that will be told for many years in the future. But even for their calamity, it greatly pales to the Houston Oilers of 1993. This team season was Days of Our Steelers. Before Days of Our Steelers. In fact, I dare say it's one of the most dysfunctional soap operas in the history of professional sports. Come with me on a journey of conflict and chaos, of ultimatums and usurping, of sadness and strife. For we are about to enter a web of horrors that resulted in irreparable damage to an organization, a fan base, and the city it played in. With Team Turmoil, prepare to see the oil crisis that ended an era of Houston football. To begin this story, we have to rewind a few months. January 3rd, 1993. The Houston Oilers infamously played a wildcard game against the Buffalo Bills at Rich Stadium. With heavy expectations, the Oilers flashed their incredible ability throughout the first half. It was domination, an utter rout of a team also with pressure to perform. When the score hit 35-3, Bills fans started for the exit gates. But we all know how this ends. Led by Frank Reich, Buffalo undertakes one of the greatest comebacks in NFL history. But to Houston, they know it by a sordid nickname. The Choke. Yet another collapse for a team that should have done so much more with what they had. They were talented, but were never a cohesive team. They were far too arrogant and cocky this past year. They felt invincible, yet were exposed before they could even step towards the podium. It was their sixth straight postseason appearance, and they failed miserably in every single one. Some expected, some outright devastating, but this was easily the worst. People needed to be fired for it, and the defensive coordinator and secondary coach paid the price in blood. Another offseason in the abyss was their final punishment. Unlike past seasons, the upcoming one was critical, which leads us to the first character in this saga, Bud Adams, the longtime owner of the Oilers. Bud's patience with this group was growing thin. He had grown weary of the failure. He was tired of paying them a handsome sum for it. Free agency will inflate player contracts. The salary cap was looming in the near future. To him, this must be the year they do something. And if they fail again, he will blow it up! He even let the team know it before the season. The pressure was on. And not just for the players. The city of Houston was growing adversarial with his demands for a new stadium. Even with renovations less than a decade ago, the Astrodome was too antiquated for his ambitions. Houston may be going through a recession due to a downturn in the oil industry, but Bud always gets what he wants. And if it means playing hardball, then so be it. Bud would go over the heads of every football man in the organization for his next defensive coordinator. For him, it was worth it. He would bring in a legend. A man whose 46 defense revolutionized the game. Buddy Ryan. A hard-nosed, no-nonsense son of a bitch that was tougher on his teams than who they played against. He had been out of football for several years after being fired from Philly under bad terms, but his reputation from Chicago was intact. However, some question why he agreed to come here. Is it to truly help the Oilers? Or is it just for his own self-interest? Rumors are swirling that he's looking for another head coaching gig, and this may just be a quick stop before he hits the road again. Even for just joining the team, he would do nothing but shit on the offense and its inefficiencies at every given opportunity. This would create issues with the head coach, who had no idea Buddy was coming into the equation. Jack Pardee, an honest man, a football lifer, a junction boy. He may not have been flashy or bombastic, but he was a coach of his word who let things come to him, not the other way around. He was a calming presence in a barrage of waves hitting the decks. In hindsight, Pardee may not have been the best coach for this squad. They needed an alpha dog, and Jack wasn't that. He was far from a bad one by any means but fit, especially with Bud going over his head with a potential threat to organizational power. This year was critical for him as well. 
As an offensive coordinator, he had a man that unlocked the talents of all those in it, Kevin Gilbride. Or as we affectionately call him now, Kevin Kildride. For all the derision now, back then Gilbride was considered to be one of the brightest offensive minds in the game. The run and shoot offense allowed the Oilers to soar to new heights, but it had glaring flaws. It never had an off switch. It was terrible in terms of game management. It forced the defense to come out fatigued after quick three and outs. The scheme was very underwhelming in the red zone. Houston lacked a conventional running game. They lived and died by the pass. And that would come to a head here as well. This would especially be with the quarterback of this cardiac crew, Warren Moon, a fantastic player and the longtime stalwart of the Oilers franchise. A dual threat option that could sky the ball in the air yet punish you with his feet. He was an excellent quarterback, but there were doubts about him as well. People were wondering if he could lead a team anywhere great. He had constant problems turning the ball over in Houston. He would get too reckless in his play. It doesn't matter that he won five straight Grey Cups in Canada. This is a man's league. And he hasn't performed when it's been needed. His protege Cody Carlson will be eager to take over for him at the first slip up. Houston didn't make him the highest paid backup QB ever for nothing. He was the future of the organization. Warren's spot will be overthrown at the first sign of trouble. And the Oilers knew it. Quarterback controversy and coaching power struggle were just two of many sagas striking the Oilers during the offseason. There was a chapter with former 85 Bears alum Wilbur Marshall, a Pro Bowl linebacker who Buddy Ryan was clamoring for the Oilers to acquire. With this man, Buddy claimed Houston would be guaranteed a Super Bowl. A trade was on. Then it was off. Then Marshall filed a breach of contract lawsuit against the team. Due to the botching, the NFL forced the trade through. Welcome to the bonfire, Wilbur. Ray Childress was upset with this contract and no-showed minicamp. The first round pick Brad Hopkins held out for a better deal. He was part of seven players that would hold out during the offseason, including Childress. The Oilers would talk about being more professional and reinforce that with a wave of skirmishes throughout training camp. Hopkins locking horns with someone right after ending his holdout. Spencer Tillman and Lamar Lathan fighting for three straight days. The tensions were beginning to bubble. Offense and defense were becoming adversarial. The struggles for power between coaches clashing at any given moment. And there hasn't even been games played yet. Would winning solve these issues? They might, if they could. The beginning of the 1993 season was full of intense pressure. The Oilers knew the stakes. Fail and be dismantled. Win and potentially be dismantled due to the salary cap. This was Houston's last great chance with the current core. It wouldn't seem like such with the entire team stumbling out of the gate in week one. In New Orleans, everything would be out of sync. The defense was still adjusting to the 46 defense. And Warren Moon wasn't his usual self. Despite the team's struggles, Buddy Ryan would gloat about the ineffectiveness of the run and shoot. Something he would affectionately refer to as the Chuck and Duck. Having enough of the Snark Star Whiteout on his given slambasts the defensive star for creating division and controversy for no reason. Buddy Ryan scoffs such attacks by stating he has no idea who Givens is. He might have gotten an idea who he was after crushing Kansas City the following week. He showed the true potential of the Oilers with brutal defense and relentless offense. However, despite the strong showing, it came with an asterisk. The Chiefs were without Joe Montana. Their offense wasn't at full strength. And apparently Houston would absorb the flaccidity against San Diego. Buddy Ryan's criticisms would prove right here. Warren Moon had a terrible game. Efficient in throwing the ball to the other team with four interceptions. Something that had been considered unthinkable before was reality. Moon was benched for Commander Cody. A quarterback controversy was brewing. Despite the defense doing its job, the Oilers would lose by a point. Although this catch technically should have been a touchdown and given Houston a win, it still wouldn't have made the offensive performance any less ugly. These blemishes would continue back at the Astrodome. Favored by ten and a half, the Oilers strike a dud against the Rams. The offense struggles again with Moon under center. Two more interceptions and sacked four times. While the defense would strong, it would buckle under 14 unanswered points. Houston was skidding into a season of expectations at 1-3, and three, but the first of two bye weeks were coming at a needed time. There was only one problem, Buffalo. Entering a horrible flashback at Rich Stadium was traumatic. The only remaining closure for a scorned team was outright slaughter. The Bills humiliated them in the style of a second half in January, with 
Jim Kelly, the 46th defense struggled to maintain their weapons. The offense was mincemeat. Warren Moon had three more interceptions as the group had seven turnovers in total. At one and four, the season was at a critical juncture. The run and shoot could only produce 21 turnovers in five games. Warren Moon was trying to dodge rumors of benching. The defense was hit or miss. The football world was wondering if this was truly the end. But a good story doesn't die so soon now, does it? Week 7 brought about a critical game for the Oilers. It may be a trip to Foxborough to face New England, but this contest means so much more to a team on the break. Jack Pardee knows it as well and he has made a change. Cody Carlson will be starting this contest. Moon would be on the sidelines, and it may be for a good bit. Carlson is starting out the game strong. However, a strange twist of fate would hit the team again. Cody was forced to leave the game due to injury. Warren Moon would have his chance at redemption. He ran with it. Technically, I should say throw, but that would imply he blew the opportunity. In a desperately needed turn of events, Moon returned to his old form. His gamesmanship and arm helped to lead Houston to a much needed victory against the Patriots. This win will hopefully lead the team to something far greater than this. Little did they know that the greater event would be more controversy. Enter David Williams, the starting right tackle for the Oilers. As the week progressed, David would stay behind for personal reasons and miss the team flight to the game. Houston executives reserved a seat for him on a charter later on to rendezvous with the group. It seemed like a fair compromise, but there was one problem. David was never on his scheduled flight. He stayed behind and no-showed the contest. The reasoning for this insubordination? His wife giving birth to a beautiful and healthy baby boy. It was David's first child, and he wanted to be there for them in this special time. He felt that this was far more important than football. The Oilers organization did not agree. Due to his abandonment of duty, the team fined him a total of $111,111. But Adams himself, a man who sacrificed family time to get to where he was, stated that David had misplaced priorities. It was only a matter of time before this strange situation would get media attention, and that it did. It went national. Major news, talk shows, you name it. There was one word on the lips of everyone with a pulse. Babygate. The saga would bring the Oilers more unwanted negative publicity and criticism, especially for their mistreatment of Williams. It would create discussions about work-life balance, excused leave for new parents, and men staying to support their wife and newborn child. The drama would continue on, but would it affect the play on the field? Some would say tensions could make the bonds grow stronger. Fresh off a much needed one and completely avoidable drama, Team Turmoil returned to one of the things they were best at, winning. Team offense and defense may have been pitted against each other by their coaches, but on the field they had become a machine. Their next victim would be a bottom feeder in Cincinnati. They may be winless, but a relentless crushing of their spirits would be the perfect antidote to their previous struggles. With every passing week, the Oilers would mold into four. Versus Seattle, the defense would continue to stymie the opposition with wave after wave of blitz packages. A 10-point win against them would get Houston back to 500. A season on the brink was being saved with every passing moment. Alas, the Bengals didn't learn from their previous encounter. The weakened state would be perfect for pure carnal annihilation of everything they held dear. Now at 5-4, and four, the Oilers were what they believed to be at the start of the season. Legitimate playoff contenders. But to have Super Bowl ambitions, you must beat those deemed your rivals. For them, one of these teams would be the Cleveland Browns. It was a rare showing for Houston. The ground game would lead them to the promised land. Gary Brown rushed for almost 200 yards to lead the offense. Buddy Ryan's 46 defense was burgeoning into one of the most fearsome in the league. Todd Philcox would be placed on a milk carton after throwing four interceptions against them. And that would be far from the end. In week 13, the Steelers would be crushed under their iron boot as well. Not only the defense flexing for six sacks and four turnovers, Warren Moon skied the football for almost 300 yards. It was a complete showing, and they were Super Bowl contenders again. To confirm these beliefs, Atlanta would be their next victim. The offense would put up 24 consecutive points as the 46 defense suffocated their prey like a boa constrictor, combining for six interceptions, three sacks, and a fumble recovery for a touchdown. 
their full potential was being realized. Despite the turmoil, the team united together to terrorize their opposition. They were too good to fail. The Oilers were a proud organization again. However, beneath this fantastic exterior, tension cracks were beginning to form underneath. The Oilers were starting to feel the wear and tear of injuries to core players. Houston lacked a conventional running game. The run and shoot would stall out frequently, having to be bailed out by the defense. The respective groups were still splintered, with Gilbride and Ryan still leading a cold war of snark and derision. Jack Pardee was having a hard time controlling the egos of his coordinators. But Adams and Oilers executives were doing nothing to quell the bubbling issues within. One spark could set the whole thing ablaze. Such a situation was almost inevitable for Team Turmoil. It was a good time to be an Oilers fan. Despite the early struggles, the team had found great form. The front page drama had seeded to a formidable on-field product. Signs were showing that this could be a special year. And with a fourth quarter field goal against Cleveland to allow Houston to win their eighth straight game, things were looking great on the surface. It was the perfect time for old friends to convene for a night they will never forget. This was the case for Jeff Ulm, reserve defensive lineman and special teamer. He had been on injured reserve for most of the season due to a broken leg, but rehab was going well, and he was planning on returning to play soon. In the days leading up to being cleared for full practice, his best friend Sean Lynch came down from Illinois to spend time with Jeff. That Monday night would be a special one between two great friends. First, a hearty and lavish meal at a local steakhouse. Next, a lively night on the town at a popular nightclub in the area. Around 2.30 a.m. on December 14, 1993, Jeff and Sean were cruising southbound on I-610 in Jeff's stylish Cadillac Eldorado. Jeff was driving while inebriated, boasting a blood alcohol level of .14. Sean was far more intoxicated and not wearing his seatbelt. During the joyride to end a fantastic night, Jeff would suddenly lose control of his Eldorado and smash into a guardrail on an interchange ramp. An unfastened Sean was ejected from the car and fell several stories onto the cold pavement below. Jeff was distraught. His best friend lay dead. One thing about Jeff was that while he was intelligent, he was incredibly temperamental. In knee-jerk and distraught reaction, he panickingly called 911, crying out to his friend below during the call. However, no police or rescue crews could come in time. It was too late. For either Sean or Jeff. Fearing Texas motorist Jeff had carried a shotgun in the trunk of his car. He would take it out. And fire three times in memory of his fallen friend. And then, a final one. Tragedy had struck the Oilers. In the days following the horrible event, Jack Pardee would take center stage for the team. He was the rock that the franchise needed for this terrible time. Calm, poised, and insightful, Jack helped to guide both the team and the city through what was one of the worst situations the Oilers had ever faced. A brother in arms killed by his own hand. Team Turmoil now had a permanent bond. The remainder of the season would be played in honor of Jeff Alm. His number would be a decal on their helmets. His locker would remain untouched. Five days after the terrible accident, Houston would defeat the Steelers at Three Rivers Stadium and clinch the AFC Central. A bittersweet send-off to a fallen comrade. However, there was still more to play for, and an ugly feud would finally erupt. If you were to look at the Oilers as an outsider after they stymied one of the best offenses in football, you would think they were favorites to win the Super Bowl. The run and shoot had issues again and Moon threw three picks, but Buddy Ryan's defense held them to only seven points. And it was enough to win their 10th straight game. And there lay the problem. The conflict between Gilbride and Ryan remained unsolved, and it was getting worse with every passing day. Gilbride was growing angry with Ryan. During practices, Buddy ordered his defense to regularly blitz the first team offense and ignored set plays. He would constantly lambast the chuck and duck in public. He had grown tired of his defensive counterpart's denigration and arrogance. In mutuality, Ryan was growing angry with Gilbride. He wasn't saying anything, but the actions of the offense were more than enough for him. The failure of the run and shoot to burn off clock was infuriating to Buddy. It had cost him great players. Bubba McDowell and Marcus Robertson were injured when the defense was forced to come out before halves ended. Robertson was lost for the season due to this, and Ryan laid the blame solely on Gilbride's feet. 
In the final regular season game against the Jets, it would come to a head. The game was domination, but the offense was coming out before half. Buddy was depending on them to close out the first half so his men wouldn't risk injury. But here lies the issue. The run and shoot didn't have an off switch. They would come out passing, and a snap is fumbled by Carlson. New York recovered and the defense would have to go out again. For Buddy, this was the last straw. He needed to make his frustrations heard. Buddy would walk towards Kevin, yelling at him to draw his attention and threw a haymaker towards his jaw. They would be immediately separated, and the punch itself missed, but the statement had been made. Gilbride was hurting his men. His incompetence cannot be allowed to fester. Kevin was incensed. He was ready to kick some old man ass all over the sideline for his showing. And he would have too if he wasn't restrained. The man that tried to injure his players in practice? Blaming him for unrelated issues? It was treasonous. And the feud was exposed on national television. The game itself was still strong for the Oilers. They had shut out their opposition and were winners of 11 straight, but none of it mattered now. The only thing that was on anyone's mind? The punch. The bitter feud between egos and masterminds playing out in front of a massive audience. Houston may have secured a first round bye on the field, but off it Gilbride and Ryan would trade jobs across a landscape of interviews and press conferences. To Buddy, Kevin could have success run and shooting leads as an insurance salesman. Actions do speak louder than words, you know. With party ineffective and ownership uncaring, it showed in the days leading up to their final test. And those actions would ring far truer than even he imagined. A year of chaos and condescension were not able to stop the Oilers from reaching the second seed in the AFC. It needs to be stated, despite all the distractions, how talented this team truly was. They boasted eight pro bowlers on the roster. Marcus Robertson was a first team all pro. Their passing offense was ranked third in the NFL. The defense led the league in interceptions, sacks, third down conversion percentage, and rushing yards allowed. Buddy Ryan's unit hadn't given up more than 20 points in a game since week six. Despite this, far too many questions lingered about January's success. With the punch still fresh in everyone's mind, the Oilers would have a home matchup against Kansas City. They had crushed them back in week two, but now there is a new wrinkle to iron out. Joe Montana. He was playing, albeit nowhere near full strength due to a lingering elbow injury. Even then, the threat of his old glory was still ever-present. It would be a challenge no matter what. The prize was within reach. A grudge match against Buffalo at Rich Stadium. Revenge for the choke. The fervor was at a fever pitch. Over 64,000 fans packed the Astrodome to set the attendance record. Riding their impressive winning streak, Houston was favored by seven against the team that lacked prime offensive talents. Their Super Bowl ambitions were never greater than this. And the Oilers were eager not to fall short of them again. This was their last chance. The threats of Bud Adams and the salary cap loomed large. Houston would see to it with a strong first quarter. The offense put up 10 quick points and the 46 defense made Montana's time a living hell. All things were going smoothly early on, but a common issue popped up for this squad yet again. The offense had stalled out. The run and shoot couldn't get the separation in time to run routes. The line was getting eaten alive by the Chiefs' pass rush. Buddy Ryan was quietly cackling to himself. Gilbride's offense was as useless as he had said it was. His defense was holding the fort. They were strong, despite a few easy touchdowns by Kansas City missed by mere engines. All would remain quiet until Joe Montana found Keith Cash for a seven-yard score. Upon seeing Buddy's face on a poster, Cash would spike it with a well-placed football. Quite ironic. The seconds would tick off the clock ever so slowly. Three points separated them from a dangerous precipice. And Warren Moon would tip the edge by throwing a dangerous deep ball into triple coverage to be easy pickings. Despite the Oilers holding the lead in the fourth quarter, it was still incredibly uneasy with the offense so ineffective. Here is where the defense saves the day. A crucial interception of Montana and Chiefs territory gave them prime field position. But the Oilers could only come out of it with a field goal. They may have been up by six, but it was unmistakable. The tide was turning. Uneasiness set in for the capacity crowd and the team alike. Kansas City was making big play after big play as Montana Magic returned for an encore presentation. A blatant pass interference on the defense would set up a dime to J.J. Burden. The offense would respond with yet another lapse in pass blocking. The ball was jarred loose and recovered by the Chiefs deep in Oiler territory. Joe Montana would throw another dagger to Willie Davis to put Kansas City up by eight. During this time, something telling had occurred with the defense. Buddy Ryan had stopped blitzing. 
He had lost confidence in his game plan. It was happening again. Houston was choking. However, there was hope this time. The run and shoot finally clicked back on again as Warren Moon put together an efficient drive to give the team life. A seamless pass to Ernest Givens would bring the score back to one. All the defense needed to do was hold for one drive. One set of stops can give Houston the closure they were truly looking for. The first two downs weren't optimal, but they hadn't given up 10 yards. A third and one standing between a chance and Dagony. Montana steps back to pass. He lobs a ball to a heavily caressed Keith Cash and he breaks free from Eddie Robinson. He remains untouched until he's deep in Houston territory. The only thing that made this worse was that Robinson was called for a holding penalty that was obviously declined. Time was no longer on Houston's side. If they were lucky, Kansas City would miss the field goal. But even then, they would falter. No timeouts for Houston. They get to Allen. He's got the first down. He's got a touchdown. Touchdown, Kansas City. Marcus Allen put the dagger in their heart. The Oilers were down by two scores with two minutes left. The atmosphere in the stadium had died. As the season ends prematurely again, the fans quickly file for the exits. The offense did the same, faltering on a four and out. It was over. The limitless hope had spiraled downward to a cruel reality of failure. Seven consecutive years of this. This time when victory was all but assured. All of the accolades and triumph over the year weren't enough. The adversity that the team went through? It was all just a fall short. The Chiefs had killed the team. And Bud Adams would make sure to desecrate its lukewarm corpse with a nuke. Oh, you thought he was kidding. <laughs> well, that's cute. The gutting of the Oilers would start with trading the cornerstone. Warren Moon to the Vikings. Bud would punish the franchise by cutting off its face. And it would be far from the last of his purge. Bud Adams was true to his word. This would be the final failure. With another season of turmoil ending in a dud, the time had come to dismantle what had made the Oilers great. Warren Moon's departure would merely be the beginning of the purge. Rumors of Buddy Ryan jumping ship the first chance he got were correct. He cashed in his defense's great performance for another shot at being the head coach of a team. When Arizona came calling, he would boast, you've got a winner in town. The winning would last two subpar seasons before the Cardinals fired him. The rest of the team suffered heavy losses as well. Wilbur Marshall, the prize offseason acquisition, would join Buddy in Arizona. Pass rushing defensive end William Fuller would defect for a lucrative deal in Philadelphia. His edge partner and team sack leader Sean Jones signed with Green Bay. Starting lineman Doug Dawson to Cleveland. Longtime offensive guard Mike Munchak retired due to knee issues and joined the coaching staff. In one fell swoop, the Oilers lost their offensive prowess, sack production, and team leadership. Despite clinging on to hope, Houston didn't just take a step back in the 1994 season. The team imploded. When they lost their identity in last season's leaders, team turmoil went into a tailspin. The longtime apprentice Cody Carlson suffered a major injury in the first week of the season and was never the same afterwards. This would be his final year in the NFL. The once mighty run and shoot offense was now a shell without a great quarterback to run it. They would finish dead last in points scored. Halfway through the year, Jack Pardy and Kevin Gilbride were fired from their respective positions. Houston would go from the highs of 12 and 4 to the humiliation of 2 and 14, setting the record for largest decrease in season to season wins in league history. Even worse, due to expansion, Houston had to settle for the third overall pick in the draft. Over the next few seasons, the great names and star power of those mighty squads that could never get it done were slowly let go of. The Oilers never properly prepared for the salary cap or life without Moon. The great heights of not even a year earlier were a distant memory. Team Turmoil was dead. It is no exaggeration to say that the 1993 Oilers killed football in Houston. Through all of the chaos and drama, the team may have been incredibly talented and soared to great heights on both sides of the ball but they failed when it mattered yet again. Another year coming up short, along with Bud Adams taking his ball and going home, destroyed any fan interest they had in the team. But what if Houston ended up beating Kansas City in the playoffs? Suppose they get revenge on the Bills and go on to the Super Bowl. If they do that, perhaps Bud Adams gets his new stadium in Houston. A deep playoff run can do wonders for a city's interest in public projects. Just ask Seattle. Maybe we have a completely different history of football just with one win in January. 
But despite all their efforts, their talent, and their drive to win, it still wasn't enough. The soap opera had taken another victim. The 1993 Houston Oilers have been immortalized. Just not for the reasons that a team would like to be. And it could have been even more dramatic. At least two players on the team were gay and were known as such in the locker room. The players and coaches didn't give a shit, there were just two of the guys, but if this got leaked out in the early 90s in the middle of the AIDS crisis, that story would have also gone national. Even then, there were little glimmers of light in this black hole of despair. The interim coach that replaced Pardee would become longtime stalwart Jeff Fisher. With the third overall pick, the Oilers selected a quarterback from Alcorn State by the name of Steve McNair. The pieces of a future core were starting to develop from the ashes. These prizes would not be for the city of Houston, however. Bud would not get the new stadium that he so desired, and would move the team to Nashville several years later. But that is a different story entirely. One for another time. Three wide receivers on the near side. But only two corners, Charlie. Elway scrambles, throws, has a man. Kubiak this time scrambled with the hands and set it up. 